lower again. So this time in Israel about virtual. So I don't know if any one of you attend my, I think it was functional reactor from the, the workshop we had. It's some, some time ago. So the most critical part now, and so really the biggest challenge for me is now how to share my screen. So I will try now. Um, I hope that I have the right for it already. And then I will try, so, and here we are. So what I'm not doing is uh, going to this presentation mode because then I'm losing the focus between Zoom and all this stuff again and again. So it's, it's just too complicated for me. So um, I think you can see the slides. Um, and yeah, that's it. So J on at five. And then we want to talk a little bit about custom test engines. And um, yeah, as you heard already, I'm working for JFrog. I'm Sven. I'm developer advocate for JFrog. I think about JFrog, I don't have to say too much. I think uh, the most people of you know it already. And well, if you have any questions or whatever after the talk or someday, the easiest way to reach me is definitely Twitter, not email. Please don't use my email address. Um, what we want to do today. First of all, I want to have a short j 5 introduction. Um, I will explain why and what and all this stuff, don't worry. Then I want to show how to test a test engine. Because if you want to start writing a test engine, you should test your test engine. Uh, this means you need to know how to start a test engine. And after this, we want to explore a little bit what, what is the minimum um, stuff you need to create a test engine itself. Um, I will show you what is the minimum part to define a test or what, what is the first step to, to start with your domain specific language you want to have for creating tests or whatever. Then how to execute test plans and some ideas what you can do. And the last part is more or less what I saw so far in the field or what I've done with test engines. And this will lead mostly into a discussion about the whole topic. So if you have any questions, I will have a half eye on this chat, but I can't guarantee that I'm seeing it all the time. So it may take some time to, to read the question and give an answer. Otherwise, we will do it in the end. So don't worry about this one. And well, everybody knows JFrog, and if you know JFrog, you know that JFrog has really cool t-shirts. So you can win one, and uh, I think this sounds perfect for COVID time. If, if you have nothing to do to, um, at home or some kids you want to want to play with, we are, um, have this roughly and have to this Nintendo Switch. So just go to jfrog.com slash show notes, and here you see the video link. Just go there. Um, I will share this later again, so don't worry about this one. So, the topic, tests, <clears throat> it's an easy word, short, but it's quite tricky if you're looking at it. So what, what is part of a test? So if, if you're looking at tests itself and to understand what, what a test engine should do or what a test engine have to manage, <clears throat> it's mostly, you have this blue thing, this subject to test, so you have whatever you want to test. So I, I don't care right now if it is a core Java test, if it's a web test, if whatever test. You have some preparations before the test because you, you need some state, then you want to run the test, and then you have some cleanup phase. It means you have to do all the work to, to make a, a clean environment again so that you can start with the next test and then you're preparing the next stuff. So <clears throat> that means that for every test, you have this preparation and this cleanup, and this must be a very safe, very robust operation. So having mistakes or bugs or whatever there, this would be a beast to find. But if you have a bunch of tests, you have some kind of global preparation. So what, what could it be? So if, if you're testing, for example, and you have a state, you're just ramping up data structure, putting data in, uh, you have it, you're running a test, you're destroying this data structure, that's it. But if you have some kind of web test, it is more complicated because you want to ramp up resources, you want to um, start a software container, a database, whatever. 
So all this stuff, you, so you have some global proportions. Here I'm showing just two layers, but have in mind that we have multiple layers. So it, it's, um, it's just an endless thing. So you can cascade it in a way that you have a quite complex structure. And um, yeah, this, this must be manageable. And so in a way that is reproducible. So if you want to run test twice or two times, you want to have exact the same result and this is not trivial. So there are a few things that, that are not so easy to handle even if you have just easy piece of source code you want to test. So, but we will call this a little bit later. So what, what are the bad things here? What, what is the tricky part here? If, if you're looking at this one, <clears throat> it implicitly means that you have some kind of context. So if you have a preparation and you're creating a data structure, the first thing is that you need to know who is holding this instance? Is this instance hold by the instance that holds all tests? Is this something that is hold by a context that is outside of the text? It's around the test. So what, who, who's holding, who's managing these resources, where, where it is? And if you have this context, have in mind that you can have there some bugs. So even inside this context or this, this part of the engine that is managing the context. And with this, um, you have to think if, if you want to go to concurrent tests, how to isolate every single context against each other. So with all complex things you want to have in mind. So there's no limitation because with Java, you can do everything. You can destroy it with off-loop stuff or whatever. So it's really up to you what you're doing. But your test engine must be able to channel this context in a, in a performant way. Uh, because if you're looking at this, um, you see that the most stuff that you see here is just burning money. The only thing that has a value in terms of, of money is that, that you want to earn somehow is the subject to test. This is the only part that is earning money, all the other parts are just burning money. That means you have to make sure that the ramp up and ramp down is as fast as possible, uh, that the maintenance of this stuff is just as easy as possible so that this is maintainable over a long time and uh, that, that this is not leading to, to more challenges than the test itself. So, and this you have again cascaded. So you have it per test, you have it per test suite, you have it per global preparation, whatever. And um, here, I, I, just, I just say that I assume that everybody at this point, or mostly, it's a symmetric thing. So you have a ramp up and a corresponding ramp down. But this is not always the case. So there are situations where you have an asynchronous behavior, and this will be tricky. As long as you have this symmetric way of one ramp up, one ramp down, that's corresponding to each other, then the plain utilities you have, or the, the basic stuff, that you have with JMN5 is just good, perfect, so easy to handle. How to deal with exceptions? With exceptions, it's, if it is an exception inside the test itself, it's not, not the challenge. But what is happening if you have exceptions during the preparations phase? This is some kind of easy, because if the preparation is failing, the whole test is failing. That's easy. So everything else is failing. But what happened if it's failing during the cleanup phase? So in a way that you're not able to see it immediately or inside the context or you're leaking memory or whatever. So this is not easy to, to analyze and that's not easy to, uh, to deal with. Uh, even if you have long running tests and you have this uh, very slow increasing memory usage or whatever. So just have in mind that you have an eye on this one. And one thing is if you have different tests, you need a bunch of different preparations. So make sure uh, that or what what is uh, the trade-off between making it generic and making it specialized so this these are the basic ideas if you have now your, your test group so a bunch of tests with a global preparation you will have a bunch of test groups so for every test group you can scale so you can have as much as you want test groups whatever the naming is test suite or test group, whatever. I don't care about it. You have just a bunch of groups and these groups have global preparations. But the 
really cool thing with JMM5 is that you have even a bunch of test engines. So, and this means you can have in one run multiple test engines that are running one after another. I'm not talking about in which order they are running. I'm not talking right now about how to activate, deactivate them, but in the end, you can have from the idea a bunch of test engines that are running one after another. So <clears throat> that means if you're designing your test engine, you have to think about what is going on before your test engine instance is running and what's running, uh, what's happening after your test engine instance is running. So um, yeah, well, I, I think this uh, dealing with states is uh, a typical thing in Java. <clears throat> so what we have so far, so this picture I grabbed from the original documentation, I think. So thanks for this one to the JML5 team. And the first time I saw this, this picture, I thought, yeah, it's easy. So I, I just jumped over it. But then a little bit later, I thought, no, there, there, there are some tricky things in. So for example, the first thing is you have this old test, you have this vintage engine on top of the platform. So this is good. So you have a platform, the fundamental base for all your test engines, and you will get at least two test engines with your installation of JML5. So if you're using it, you have the vintage one and you have the Jupyter one. The vintage one is for the old JML4 test. Here you will see what's going on if you have tricky bees running with, with rules and all this stuff and all this legacy code. Some, some things are running, some things are running well, and some parts, well, you have to work on. But the good thing is, if you can run multiple test engines, you can think about migration, about slow migration. This is good because if, if you're creating at one time your own test engine, you have to make sure that you can easily migrate to another implementation or back to the generic one or whatever. So migration is always a topic, even, even during testing. Testing is our production code. And with this production code, we are producing the production code for the customer. So uh, we should treat test code like production code for the customer. So it's just our production code. And uh, that means I have to think and calculate in the same way. So uh, I have to think about how to maintain it, how to get rid of it, how to change it and so on. So um, talking about the old stuff and the platform, then you have the Jupyter engine. This is a new fancy j 5 environment. Everything is green and shiny right now. And everybody's happy to work with this one. And then we have some kinds of use cases where we need or want to have third party test engines. We will go to this one later. But um, if I'm checking this one, I, th I thought, yeah, it's clear. But then this bubble, at the bottom, this is this is something that, yeah, that was stealing some nights. So you see that IDEs and build tools, Eclipse, Maven, and so on, they are all running the platform. And if you have in mind that something is invoking the platform, and just thinking about oh, they are work, they, they are dealing with reflection somehow in class paths and loading and all this stuff, it turned out that in some situations, it is a difference if you run your stuff in Eclipse or in IntelliJ. So your test plan is slightly different or between Maven and Gradle. So it depends on class paths, on loading, on how this stuff is done. So if, if something really weird is happening, just try if you have the same results if you're just switching between the IDE or whatever, just, just as an idea. So, and if you're building your own test engine, you have to deal with some class, parting, uh, class loading stuff later. Have in mind that your test engine will be invoked by a bunch of different tools, Maven, Gradle, Eclipse, IntelliJ, NetBeans, whatever. And make sure that everything that you're doing inside your test engine is as much as possible robust against this tiny little changes in this class pass universe. And then I'm not talking about models and all this stuff. This is just, just more. So, JONet5. So we, we have the subject to test as preparations and we have the global preparations and all this stuff. So we have three parts with JONet5 that is 
defining more or less one test. <clears throat> it is test definition itself. Here it's just add test. Then we will discover a little bit a way how to extend this one, how to customize this one. And then we have the extension context itself. So these three parts, they are the main parts of this life cycle and the life cycle management. So what, what's going on in test and how long it lives and so on. And this we have to understand and we have to learn what's going on in the Jupyter engine because this is a test engine we need later to test our test engine throughout this Chigno Act challenge. I think it's very familiar that a test is just inside a class, a method with the annotation at the test. So it looks trivial right now, but there are a lot of stuff we can customize if we want to create our own test later. So here I assume that the test definition is always inside a class. So a test is written as Java code, which is it's not limited, no limitation. So you can define for your test engine, test in a way, whatever you want. It mustn't be source code. Just have in mind, uh, be creative. So you can do a lot of stuff. So it mustn't be source code. Here I'm assuming that it's just source code. And in source code, I have this annotation at test. Well, that's it. And uh, we have some difference between JUnit 4 and 5. So in, in terms of uh, must it be a public class or not, it could be, it mustn't be a public class and it mustn't be a public method. So, but this is just some technical crumb you, uh, uh, stuff here. You can just create it in the documentation. So I don't want to go here in detail, but I want to customize it because if I want to write a test or if I want to create a state and clean up the state, I need the possibility to extend the life cycle, to customize the life cycle. And the nice thing here in JUnit 5 is that they handled it uh, with more or less like, like events. You have the before each event, the after each event, you have the before all event and so on. And every event is um, represented by a functional interface. So here you see, I, I want to create an extension that is manipulating the state before and after a test. And then I have to implement two functional interfaces, the before each callback and the after each callback. There are some more of this uh, lifecycle events. Just go to the documentation. It's, it's a bunch of, of extensions uh, or callbacks. And then you can uh, see what, what's the order they are, um, they are uh, thrown uh, or invoked and so on. But in the end, you just have a regular class. Here I'm, I'm just using it as inner class. This is why, why it's this extension from static. So, but um, you have this before each callback, and for this you have to implement the before each method, and then you have the after each callback. And to activate your extension, even if you have nothing in this extension, it's just using this extend with annotation on the class level or on the method level, and then connect the class, so my extension, with the class you want to have associated with. So here extend with my extension, at the class I want to have it. So that's the easiest and straightforward thing to, to extend. Now you have the possibility to do something in before each and you have something, uh, the possibility to do something after each. So it means we will get this instance of extension context. We will have a look at this a little bit later. Then you can do some code. Then the test will be invoked and then you have, uh, can do something that um, is done after the test. So far so good. Before we are diving a little bit into how to deal with this extension context and all this stuff, I just want to see how I can deal with multiple extensions. So this you need to know, because if you have extension A and extension B, there's one interesting thing, how to activate all of them, how to combine them, and what's the order they are invoked. So here, if, if you are doing it straight, uh, then you can just annotate, your test class with all extensions you want to have. And the next question is, which order they are invoked? And this is different. So if you're writing extend with A and then extend with B, it's different to extend with B and then extend with A. So order matters. So this is what you should have in mind. And later at this point, it is clear that this way of extending a bunch of, or so extend a class with a bunch of extensions in this way is just not refactoring safe and it's just, just a question of time 
that your colleague will do it slightly differently, it will be a disaster. So it will just go wrong. Odds done so far. If you write it in this order, first B, then A, it's called from top to bottom. So it will start with before all B, then it will be call, uh, called uh, the method from before all A. Then you will have before each B, before each A, then the test, then after each A, after each B, after all A, after all B. And this is good. So they're going one, two, test, two, one, back. So this is very symmetric and it makes it very easy to handle because if you have the RAM bubble database first and then the software container, it will be invoked in a different way. So just destroy the software container and then destroy the database. So this is easy and straightforward. And for the most uh, things, this is just the right way to go. So it, it was a good decision to do it like this, but sometimes it doesn't fit. That's it, but have it in mind. So if you want to well, maybe it's, good, uh, it's a good thing to just give a, a, a quick motivation uh, for this. Uh, it's a good way if you want to uh, extract a before, uh, like a method that you wrote uh, before, uh, before test and after test, something that you know from JUnit 4, and you wanted to, to apply it for, let's say, 10 different tests, but the same before, before test and after test. So this you can extract next. them, so you can extract them, so just people to have the motivation and wh why, why would they even create that? Yeah, okay, this is more or less what, what's coming up next. So how to, how to maintain this stuff. So, um, but, but the main thing is if, if you start dealing with, with life cycles or with preparations, um, some, some developer um, want to do it over inheritance, a classic traditional way. So, so I have my base test and then I'm um, extending my base test and then I'm going over the inheritance. And this inheritance means that you can just inherit from one parent. And so you have a linear list of inheritance. And the other thing could be that you have a bunch of interfaces with stateless stuff, and then you have a composite of uh, these interfaces, but those ways are not really what you want to have. So to, to um, if, if you have a bigger project and you want to make sure that the surface container, for example, for this project is invoked always in, in, some, yeah, in some way that you need it for, for this uh, project. So you, you would have one developer that's creating this extension. I'm ramping up our surface container. So, and he, he assumed that the database is already there and he assumed that after his preparation has done something, whatever. He's just focusing on how to ramp up the surface container. Then you, what you can do, you can write this extension, you can make a jar out of it, give it a version, push it to your artifactory and use it somewhere. So it's just a regular piece of code and you extracted some kind of um, functionality. So it's just a decomposition of a big bunch of functions to tiny pieces, atomic pieces, so that you can compose them to more complex um, piece of code. And if you want to compose it, it's more or less, you have these atomic pieces and it's really good advice to, to think in an extension that is more or less atomic so that you don't uh, think about what is coming before, what's coming after. So it must be in the ideal world, something independent. <clears throat> and uh, this is basic extensions, uh, mostly have these technical names like ramping up database, ramping up surface container, whatever. And the next level would be that you build a composition. For example, I have a web test. A web test assumes in my project, first database, then surface container. And that means if you have a composite of extensions, you start now with this, those extensions, so this, um, that you um, annotate your um, interface, this annotation here, with add extensions, then you're adding all your extensions you wrote in the order you want to have them invoked. And then you have one annotation you can use for your test. So it means the wording in this um, piece of code is more domain specific and the basic extensions more technical. So with every layer you're adding, you will have a more domain specific wording. And then you have later for the developer just um, add web test, add database test, add whatever test or at customer, whatever test. 
So you can start building a complex hierarchy based on atomic leases of extensions. And the next thing is, if, if you know how to compose this hierarchy, the next thing is who's holding the uh, instance you're creating. So for example, if I'm creating an instance of my Undertow or Tomcat, who's storing this instance? Because if I have different, uh, if I have different tests running concurrently, I need concurrent invocations of Tomcat, so different uh, to, uh, Tomcats. I can create them uh, with different ports or with test containers, whatever. And then who's holding this instance? Um, it's, it's not recommended, it's highly not recommended to, to have an attribute in your test class that is holding this instance. Because it's not sure that you are using always the same instance of this test class or it's being invoked several times or whatever. So don't, don't trust this one. But there is this extension context. This extension context is more or less a hash map. So you have this context and then you can grab out stores. Stores is just a naming schema and this name will give you a key value store. And in this key value store, you can put um, the instance here. I'm just putting a string in, but you can put in the software container instance. So new undertow and then storing it. And inside the test, you don't have access to this extension context, but just during this um, callback phases. So if you have before each and after each, to get the same uh, instance, you're just going to the same store with the same name. Here I'm just using the global one, it's not perfect, but so you have to think about a scalable naming schema. And then you can say, okay, give me from the extension context the store I want to have, and here's my instance I, I want to deal with. So, and then you can run down. During the test, you don't have access to this instance, but you can use, for example, the instance that is running. So, um, the next thing what you, need sometimes is the possibility to inject something into your test because the extension context you don't have access to this instance but if you want to have an init during the life cycle you want to create something and then you need this instance inside your test you have this injection mechanism and for this you need this um, parameter solver a parameter solver is just an interface again and this has two methods supports param here, what you're doing is just you define how to identify that this instance that should be injected is managed by this parameter solver. For example, here I'm just checking for an instance, marker uh, interface or whatever. And then the method resolve param will be invoked after supports param is true. And then you will get the same information, the parameter context or some, some context from the invocation itself and the extension context. And then you can grab the information you need out of it and create an instance of whatever you want to have injected. So this is a basic thing, but um, well, for the details, you need to read the documentation for sure. And there are slightly a uh, few difference between the you know, versions of JNF5. So I have to make sure that you're reading exactly the right documentation for your um, version you're using. But this is more or less everything. So you're identifying the type, you're have the decision I'm responsible for, and then you're creating this stuff. And here you can do everything. There's no limitation. You can ask a database, you can do whatever. Whatever magic in Java is possible, you can do here. To activate this parameter server, for example, uh, for method, you can just extend with and then declaring the class. So what you have right now is you can manage the lifecycle with extensions now, and you can get stuff injected from outside. So and with this, you have a lot of tooling that will help you to test later your test engine or whatever, your regular test. So it means if, if I want to write a custom test engine, I'm writing a piece of code. And this means if I'm doing TDD, then I want to write a test from a test engine. So what I need for this one, I need a way to test a new test engine. And for this, it's highly recommended to use a Jupyter engine because this is the best out of the box test engine you get. So use this one to test your test engine. And if your test engine is at some development stage that you say, okay, now I can test myself, feel free to change. But um, the first recommendation is just go with this one. What I want to have, uh, I want to first um, see what, what is a test input. So for, for this 
test engine, the input is source code, is a test class. And I have here an example that is one positive test, the test uh, one. The test two is just um, throwing a runtime exception, so it's a failed one. And the third one is a disabled test. And now I want to check how I can test if the test engine is doing exactly what I'm expecting. So for this, you need a dependency in test scopes, uh, uh, JUnit uh, platform test kit is a version you want to have or you're working with. And again, here I have one positive test, one test that's failing and one that is just disabled. And how to identify that the test engine is doing exactly what I'm expecting. So how to test my test engine. I have uh, this class engine test kit and there's a study method engine. And here we will um, cover this later what an engine ID is, but I will give you the engine ID from the test engine I want to test. Here it's JUnit Jupyter. Then I define what is the input for this test engine. And here I'm using the selectors. I have done static import. So if, if you're dealing with reflection, just check what, what support utilities is part of this JUnit um, uh, dependency you have already because they have done a really good job with um, reflection. So don't write this stuff by yourself. Uh, try, try this one. So. And here what I'm doing is I'm selecting a class and I'm selecting exactly this class I defined before. And it means this is my test input. So, and then I'm executing the whole stuff and I'm grabbing out the tests. And then I start analyzing it with a third statistics. And this means I check how many started, how many succeeded, how many skipped and how many failed. And then you see, okay, two tests started one is disabled, one was positive, one was skipped, and one was failed. So exactly what I'm expecting. And this is a way how you should test your test engine later too. So you have to define how to define a test and what you're expecting. And with this, you start writing tests against your own test engine to make sure that the behavior is exactly what you want to have. So, uh, no, this one. So, yeah, okay. So now I want to test what, what I will get out if I want to have the dedicated behavior or the specific behavior of a test. So if I'm just checking if a test is good or bad, it makes no sense. So I need more information. For example, I want to analyze if this test two that's failing is exactly failing in a way I'm expecting it. And here I'm doing exactly the same. So I have my test engine. I'm selecting now the method of this class with the name test002. This is not nice because it's not refactoring safe. So the string is not bound to the method instance itself. So that's a weak point here, but you're defining one method. So now I have in test input, just one method. And then I'm executing this one. And the first thing is I'm just checking, okay, this one failed exactly what I thought. And then I can grab out the events and the characteristic, uh, this, this is um, detailed information. So it's finished with failure. Yes, it's, um, it was a runtime exception. Yes, and there was a message exactly with this one. So you can check what kind of exception happened and if it is exactly the um, input or the, the, the message of this exception. With this, you can test against failures. If I have this one, so I can now test, I can invoke a test engine, I can uh, define what's the input of this test engine for this run, and then I can analyze uh, the results after a test engine run was successful. So the next thing is how to get this test. So a test engine should discover somehow the test. Then I prepare the launcher, I'm creating a test plan, which is what actually should be invoked in, in some way. And then I'm registering some, some kind of listener. They, they're just collecting information during the run and then I'm executing everything and consuming the result. So I'm not expecting that everybody is reading the whole source code and, and remembering it. So you have the slides, uh, go to uh, jeffrock.com slash show notes or check on, um, on the internet. So the slides are available, otherwise ask me. And then you can uh, go to this in detail. What I want to show you is uh, general behavior of the general way to go. So what you are creating first is a request. So you're selecting the input you want to have for this test. For example, here I'm selecting some package. So with this request, um, this one I need, 
And then I need instance of listeners, listeners that are collecting information during the test run. Here I'm just using the summary generating listener, the default one that's uh, part of this. And the bad thing here is that, um, so far I know, you, you have to hold this instance because if you're creating this instance and um, using it during the uh, creation of this configuration, um, then you're not getting this stuff out after, after the test run is uh, Done. So if you have to hold this instance of the listeners, then you're building the configuration. It's, um, I highly recommend that you're switching off all this auto registration and whatever stuff so that you have control what is activated and what's deactivated. Then you're creating one instance of your test engine and you see the Jupyter test engine is just a new constructor, it's just creating an instance so easy, so no, no magic. And then you're combining those in the configuration and after this. We're just running it. Uh, it means first you are discovering. So discovering is this reflection magic that will build the test plan if you're defining your test in source code. But feel free to build your test plan in any way you want to have. So it could be something completely different. The only thing is you need some instance of a test plan. That's it. Then you're executing this stuff. And after this, you're grabbing the information out of your listeners from the test run. How this is done? We will have its next. So the basic structure to create a test engine, really the absolute minimum is, I don't want to have a real test discovery. I just want to have a test engine that will be invoked. And uh, I just want to see if, if the test engine will be invoked by Maven, by the IDE and so on. This is the first uh, useless test engine. What I need so far is I need in compile scopes, a JUnit platform engine, and I need the platform comments in compile uh, scope, yeah. Sven, and then, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. I'm not sure that I understand why do we need test engines at all? Test engines, okay. So why, why, why should I write my own test engine? Okay. Um, the main thing is if you have, if you have complex lifecycle, for example, and you want to um, manage this one, for example, if, if you have an, um, Heavy infrastructure that you want to run before the whole test plan is running. So far, I know you have to do it outside. Then you're running the whole test plan, and then you can ramp it up. So your, your lifecycle is not managed by JUnit completely anymore. Um, or you want to have something like a license check, for example, because you're building a product. Or you want to have something like flaky tests. Or you want to have something like um, uh, what's this called? This um, Mutation test cover, uh, for example, mutation test engine, or you want to have this uh, other test techniques, or you want to create your own DSL, you want to have something like a behavior driven or whatever domain specific language uh, to, to give the possibility to create or to define tests. So, all this stuff, we should start thinking about creating a test engine because the generic Jupyter engine is good for the most cases, but if you're going to specific cases, the, the way to create all this stuff. For example, if you're running web tests, you have a complex life cycle, you want to ramp up Selenium nodes, you're dealing with Docker images and all this stuff, then sometimes it's easier if you're writing your own test engine for exactly this case and makes the whole life cycle management easy. Or if you want to integrate in existing infrastructure, you need to connect to, to other resources. Um, or you want to distribute tests. For example, I, I wrote a proof of concept for a distributed test engine so that you're collecting your stuff, you're pushing all this into a Hazelcast cluster, executing it concurrently, and then collecting the information. So writing this one with a regular JMA for Jupyter engine is just pain. And then writing your own test engine is straightforward. And sometimes, yeah, you have to decide at, at what complexity level you're switching to your own test engine implementation. I hope um, this was a short, short why. Um, any, any other question to this one right now? Okay, so um, to write a test engine is not, not so complex. Um, and sometimes really it's, it's easier as, as writing a complex lifecycle with extensions. Um, the only thing you have to do, you have to implement a test engine and then you have exactly three methods to implement. So get an ID, this is a unique ID you need to identify this test engine. You need to discover your tests. Here, feel free to decide 
how to discover tests or if you want to consume a database to grab information out of it to build a test plan against whatever if you want to read text files to create your test plan if you want to whatever you are thinking about here's the right place to, to identify how to create a test plan and then there's this execution phase just you have your test plan and now you're going recursively to all charts in this tree inside your test descriptor or your test tree and executing this one so this is more or less uh, the basic what you need and um, yeah that's that's let's go to to this one if if we have done exactly this one so for example here i'm just um, giving an idea whatever you need i just me uh, taking the simple name then i'm creating exactly one node the root node from my test plan and no test in it so just the root node and then what i'm doing in the execution phase is just from my request i'm grabbing the root the test descriptor from my master point and then i'm grabbing all listeners out of it i'm executing this stuff so i say okay now i start executing my test i'm going to the engine grabbing all children out of it going to every children saying to my listener whatever listener you want to have you yeah, just have this execution listener say okay i start executing i'm finishing successful or failed it depends what what is the result of it here i'm just saying successful and after this i'm just saying okay i'm done so we're going recursively this tree down and collecting the information about every single test he has no test so you have just a success going to the root node and that's it so with this with yeah sure. yeah sure um maybe i'm misunderstanding where is the test actually run the test is running we will come to this uh, with the next next um test engine this is just the whole thing but during the execution during during the time the execute method will be invoked you're going to all test nodes it's a tree and then you have different kinds you have container tree nodes and you have um, test tree nodes and if you are going to the test node or if you have a test node you will have all the information you collected during the discovery process for example what class what method what whatever date time whatever you need and then you have the possibility to say execute now and this is the place where you're actually really executing the test itself. Okay. Yeah, we will come exactly to this one. So, um, so if, if you're just going off the root node with no test inside, you will get already the whole support that you see, I have one container started, one was successful. So it's, it's running. So you can use Maven already if, if you activate it. I will show it how to activate it, but this is just a valid test engine. It's not testing, it's completely useless, but so how to define your own test. So for example, that you can load, I have my nano test, my body test, my database test, whatever, for your own test engine. So we have to create an annotation. Then we are executing all, uh, we want to uh, discover all tests. We uh, annotate it with this nano test and then we execute it. And what I want to have is next is that the IDE is supporting it and Maven is supporting it. And then you have more or less everything you need at this point. To build this marker, you have just to create an annotation with target on a method, for example, if you want to have it on method, if you want to have it on method in class, then you're just using element type method and class. This is good if you want to make sure that some annotations with information inside the annotation is just used on a class level because you want to have this one for init processes and some others just on a test method level uh, so that you're not mixing up attributes, for example, for global preparation and for local preparation or whatever. The only thing is that you really need is a retention policy runtime. Well, otherwise you can't grab this stuff out with reflecting data. And there's one thing called test able. And this is the only thing you really uh, have to understand wh why this is there. We call this test able. So here I'm doing this one here, for example, for the uh, target on class. I want to have one iteration that is just for init on class level. And this one was just for init on method level, if you want to divide it, it's up to you. But the only thing that is a little bit magic is this test able. And test able is more or less, they, um, I think it was coming from JetBrains, so they, they need the IDE 
uh, need a possibility to identify what annotation is actually a test annotation to support it. And you're completely free. You're, there's no inheritance or whatever. So you need some kind of identification. And then they defined, we have this, uh, this annotation test able and the IDE vendors are listening or checking for test able. And if they found this interface or this, this annotation, they will treat this interface like a test, uh, like a JUnit at test annotation. But then for your test engine. So that is why you need this at test able so that your IDE is supporting it. And after this, it's all ready. So to have this run in Nano engine, just a new ID because we have a new engine. And the main thing is you have to define what is a test class or test method. Uh, for this, here's the part where you can define the syntactical behavior of it. So how to define a test. So you can say, I'm not supporting abstract classes. I'm not supporting private classes and I'm not, uh, and I want to have explicit annotation nano test class. So then I will check if uh, I have, for example, some, some other attributes. So here you're defining what is the minimum requirement so that it will be treated as a test class. So I extracted here this one just as a predicate because we need it later. So everything you need to define plus the annotation that is um, the marker for your test class. If you have this for test methods, for example, you can say, okay, I'm just executing if it is not static, if it is not private, if it is not abstract, if I have a param count that is exactly zero, or you can say, okay, I want to have at least a param of type A or of type B. So here you're defining the syntactical stuff, how to define a test. And this is more or less uh, the, the first step to define your requirements for the test environment. If you want to make sure that every test method will have an inject at whatever test class or report or whatever, here's the right place to make sure it is just grabbing this one. Then annotate it with an annotest. Okay, it's a test method. And you can define if you want to have some kind of return type. For example, if you want to have statistics or some kind of return from every test method, because you just want to have it for whatever. Then you can define here, okay, the test method must have a return type A or B or whatever. So here you can define everything you need. Again, just a predicate. We need it later during the discovery process. The discovery will give you four entry levels. And this is a little bit tricky. If you're doing it the first time, you're, you're just going here a little bit mad. And I'm not sure if it is already changed, but you have to write, copy, paste this boilerplate code by yourself. It's, it's just pain. I hope they will change it sometime. But it's always the same. So what you're doing is you have this class pass root selector, this package selector, this class selector and method selector. And here's the change. So if you're running with Maven, for example, on a package, then you will get a package selector. If you're using exactly the same with right click on IntelliJ, you will get a class pass root selector with a filter. So you have to implement all these four ways to uh, to work or to deal with the selectors. Otherwise, the behavior is slightly different or some, something is just not working. But in the end, what's, what's going on here is just you're going recursively from this part you are, you are in through all entities you have. You're grabbing every single class, going in every single class to every single method and checking with your predicates if it is a test class and if it is a test class, if this is a test method you want to support. So this is what's going on here. Um, this is a bunch of code. It's just going recursively down. So, okay, if you have a class, check if it is a test class and then um, append all methods to the next test level and so on. So, and if you have uh, found something, you're creating a descriptor. And the descriptor, we will see the implementation, is more or less, uh, right, let's see here. The descriptor is the node inside the test plan. And this is a place where you hold all the information that you need during the runtime, during the test execution. So you're collecting here in this container nodes, for this uh, root nodes, for example, uh, the class name, the method name, and some whatever input. So. These are the descriptors and 
then you are going to checking class, going over it, creating this descriptor, and so on. So the main thing is you're going recursively through all class passes you have just to a package, just to a class, or just checking a method using the reflection utils from the JNF5 team because this is making the work really easy. And then what you want to have is more or less this test plan, make a tree out of it, please no graphs. And then you have two nodes. You have a type container and type test. Why you can have a test and a container at the same time, I don't know, that's possible. Mostly easy, it's just hold everything in a container or a root, a node should be always a container until there are child, children and the children, the last one should be a test. It's the easiest way to, to define it. And then uh, have a look at this abstract test descriptor and don't implement the interface because there's a bunch of work already done. So you can go there as well. So how to deal with this? What you can do, not must, but you can. What you can do if you're on a class level and classes are the definition to define tests, if you have a class test descriptor, what you can do, you can go from here recursively down, for example, finding all methods in this test class, checking if it is a valid test method, and then just creating the next test descriptor and adding this one. So it's just a recursive way. Going yeah. down. So make sure that you are giving back the type. It's the last line here, type container, type tests, so that later during the execution phase, it could be identified right. Excuse me. Oh, come on. So, um, coming now to, to the information you have during the execution phase. So, the last thing, uh, the children, for example, the last children in the street, um, is the last note, will have all this information. Here, I'm just collecting the test class and the test methods that, would, uh, that is identified. If you have inside your annotation some, some um, information like an um, attribute inside your annotation, it would be good during the discovery process to extract this value and store it in this test descriptor as well. Because this one will be used during the execution a little bit later. So here is the right place to store all the information you need for the test that is static and not requested during the execution. The executor itself. So now, if, if we want to execute it, so it's just, it depends on the level you are. If you're on the root node, the engine descriptor, just say, okay, execute this container, start with recursive going down. The next one, we have class descriptors. If it is a class descriptor, just say, execute this container. It's nothing else that's going one step down. And then the last one, if it is a test method, test descriptor, we're actually executing this stuff. Means in container, it's just, I will say to my listener, I'm getting out of this request and say, I will start working on this level. Then I'm going to all children and execute them. And if nothing is happening, I will say, I'm execute, I'm finished, I'm done, and I'm positive or negative. So on this you are doing for every layer. If you have three layers in your tree, you're doing this for two layers. And the last one will be the execution method. And here again, I'm now on method level, I start execution, I'm executing the test method, and I'm giving back the results, the test execution result. So after we have done all this repetitive work, really copy paste this stuff, it's really, don't write it by yourself. Then we're coming to the final execution of a test. And this means I have this method test descriptor, or whatever your name of the test descriptor is. Everything inside this descriptor is now usable for the execution, plus everything you can request now. And then what, you are, what I'm doing here is I'm just using the reflection utility to create this test class. I'm invoking by reflection this scene method. And if no um, exception is happening, I assume it's right. I'm giving back successful. If there's any kind of exception, I'm just saying it's failed. That's it. If you need technology here in this one, like CDI, like whatever, it's the right way here to get all this technical infrastructure to execute your test. But this is the main thing. So here you can do everything that Java is allowed and just do whatever you want. The main thing is something is happening, it's failed. If everything's right, the feedback is successful, that's it. So now you're able 
to write the whole engine in a little bit more compact way. So getting an ID, you have the two ways to define if it is a test class or a test method, here with this predicate. Then you're going down, building up the test plan during the discovery process. And the execution is just going over this test plan and executing every single test inside this hierarchy. That's it. And you're collecting information. Sven, does it yeah. mean that the platform is very, very uh, thin layer? Uh, yeah, it's just a little bit called cool, cool Java. So the platform itself is just, just a few methods. It depends. So it, it really depends. So how to create, so one, one tricky thing is how to create your test plan. If you're just going over source code, you're just scanning your class paths, identifying the methods, collecting them from you, that's it. If you have a test engine that is combining different resources, for example, uh, at this uh, date on this machine with this class path and whatever, this configuration, this creation of a test plan is more or less the work. And the next work that should be done is execution itself. It's just a bunch of source code that will be executed. So the test. So most people are just thinking that uh, a test plan should be just defined in, in source code, but it's not, it's not the limitation. So be creative here because then you have the full potential of this test engine so that you have the wrapper to, to execute all this stuff. The next thing is how to um, activate this one. It's just uh, the service locator here, org, JUnit, platform engine, test engine, and then you're just writing the class name in it. And what you achieved now is you can now take a class using at nano test class on the class level and nano test on the test level. And you have full IDE support now, you have full Maven and Gradle support now. So, so it's, it's done. So you have now a complete independent test engine that you can just wrap in a jar, making a version out of it and let your team use it. Why, why, or what can you do with these test classes? So um, for example, if you have a commercial product and you want to have something like license check, you can do it inside your uh, test engine. On the other side, if you have license checks because you're consuming expensive resources, then you can do it inside your test engine. This authentication authorization process can be done inside this uh, test engine, um, ramping up some specific infrastructure, checking against uh, uh, limitations, something like a um, fail break or some, whatever, whatever you want to have, you can add in this um, test engine that is helping you to manage the life cycle and to make the usage of the test itself easy. The main specific test definition. So if you want to have something like behavior driven tests or whatever, some other way of defining test, it's up to you to define the syntactical environment you want to use to define a test plan. You can use this um, test engine for dynamic test input of external resources. For example, if you are not able to write it in core Java because you have to ask during the time of the execution some external system to get some stuff out, a single test engine would be a good place uh, compared to extensions. If you have different te testing techniques like mutation testing or property-based testing or uh, random monkey testing or whatever uh, statistic you want to use for your testing or security payload testing for you. Uh, all this stuff you, you can use a um, dedicated test engine for it that is specialized for this so that you don't have to build with generic tooling this behavior. This is mostly easier. One thing is you can create persistent immutable test plans. If you're creating test plans and you're doing it twice and you're doing it once with Maven, once with uh, IntelliJ, it could be that the test plan is some kind of different. It depends on how to create the set plan and it depends what are the, the weak points here, like reflection or ordering or sorting or whatever. If you want to have immutable test plans because you want to have this test plan stored with built information so that everything is reproducible, even the test plan, here's a good place to go because you have the test plan and you can store it in a way that you can share it, rerun it exactly in the same way. What you can have, for example, is like something like test execution priorities based on the um, usage on external resources or your own resources, you can prioritize tests on different machines, on different nodes, whatever, because you can interact with 
distributed system, for example, if you're spreading it over Hazel Cars Cluster or if you're going to whatever system. So you, you can do a lot of stuff that is complicated with regular extensions and complex lifecycle, to be sure. If you have a complex lifecycle, have a look at this one. For example, this I mentioned already. So if you have, for example, uh, the need for, for distributed uh, test execution, then uh, this could be one thing. The test engines just grabbing the classes, pushing it to a distributed class loader to uh, distribute, uh, distributed execution nodes, run the stuff there, grabbing it back. I have done it, for example, with uh, testing um, Vardin apps because Vardin itself and the web tests with ramping up the Selenium stuff and database and it was slow. So I just scaled horizontally because the test itself is slow. So I'm scaling horizontally and this was easy done with, for example, Mesocos. So inside your test engine. Um, yeah, then security payloading is one thing you should have in mind. For example, if you want to have uh, security payloads for, for your um, APIs or whatever, then you could do it like uh, you have a repository, you're asking for the binaries, so they're immutable, you're creating this pass plan, you're injecting this stuff, and the test result will be distributed, for example, in external reporting systems or on uh, whatever. So it's, it's really, if you have these complex life cycles and need for documentation, all this stuff, uh, custom test engine is, is pure gold for it. Because you can customize, for example, auditing systems and all this stuff, or um, creating a runtime metrics uh, to, to see how much time you're burning on every single machine and, and, and. So this one, okay, well, if, if you're spawning new nodes with a test engine with Docker or uh, loading dynamically stuff, uh, it's perfect if you're using Artifactory with it ready to scan on the fly because we have this REST API and then during the execution, you can provision the whole environment. So you can say, I want to have for every single test step a dedicated repository I'm using if one test is failing. So one step of my test pipeline is failing. I'm holding all states until this one and I'm just rerunning the latest step of my test pipeline. So I'm not doing all this stuff again and again. So you're killing reboots with this. So this is one, one interesting thing and we have the license checking all this stuff. Um, yeah, well, so more or less, I'm, from the technical point of view, I'm I'm done with the test engines. I hope I could give some ideas what you can do with this one. For sure, you can try this for free. Uh, check the website, there are some, some interesting news. So just, just as a heads up. And um, well, I'm open for questions now. If someone has some experience or some questions or some ideas, it would be just the right right time to, to ask. Ooh, too far away. Well, the main thing is um, just right. If you want to have this code, the boring part with the discovery, just let me know. I have this demo somewhere on GitHub, I think, already, so that you can just start with ramping up your own test node and then playing around with this stuff. Um, yeah, you can do it with every everything that's running more or less on the JVM, so with Kotlin or whatever. Um, yeah. Then uh, can I have a small question? Sure. Uh, do you have uh, some recommendation of uh, migration strategy between uh, JUnit 4 and 5? Documentation, well, not, not really documentation. I, I just know that, I, I only know that mostly people have trouble with, with these rules. So how to migrate this. So everything that is inside the life cycle, that is more or less a pain. So if this is complex, and then for example, if you have to, to rebuild this life cycle, then sometimes it's, it's really it's a good thing to, um, to have an own test engine. But then you can rebuild this lifecycle uh, without doing this stuff. Or you can check, for example, if, if you want to have some special support for this. But this is the only thing I know. So migrating, if, if you're not able to run it with a vintage engine inside your JUnit 5, 
platform and you really have to migrate this stuff, well, you have to check how much code you really want or if it is just running with a vintage engine. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, one more. So maybe Anybody has a, maybe a gener general purpose question on journey five? It's a, maybe a good time to ask. Oh, the easiest thing is really, the documentation is not bad for the, for the core stuff. So just start writing your first test. Um, going in detail, um, if, if you start writing extensions, don't do the mistake and, and uh, hold instance by yourself. Really go over the extension context, do it. Um, so I saw too, too often, don't go over inheritance, don't do it. So I do, do it like makes sense also, as also really of our own composition of extensions. Um, otherwise it's a very, very straightforward thing. Sometimes a little bit tricky if you need, for example, this parameter server to create a dynamic range of input values. So they, they have this uh, important CVS or whatever stuff. But if you really want to read the config based on this config and the environment variable, for example, oh, I'm on a Windows machine and now I want to create this web driver and another web driver. So stuff like this, this is, um, this is not so handsome with, with core extensions. So, so if, if you're on this level, then, then think about how to manage this life cycle. Even, even, uh, then mostly it's not symmetric. For example, you have, uh, what's, what's the right time to create a web driver? If you have a bunch of web drivers, what you are doing with web drivers, if one test is failing, because then the whole test uh, execution is just killed. So all this stuff. So then, then think about some convenience with your own test engine. It makes your life really easier. So it, it seems that the real meat here is inside the, um, the engine themselves. So j 4 as we know it, is, is every, everything essentially is inside the vintage implementation of the test engine, right? So the platform seems really, really thin. Yeah, it's just execution of a test engine and this is executing three methods more or less. That's it. So idea, discovery, execute. That's it. So this is a thin layer. Uh, what's really good is this reflection stuff they, they built. So I really recommend you to have a look at this one because there, there's a lot of work done inside the reflection utils. Um, but give it a try. So if you have your blueprint for a test engine, it's just a template project and then defining your new syntax because the boring part is the discovery. If you're just going over classes, then the discovery process is always the same. Maybe they extracted it now for with a better abstract class. What you never should do, my personal experience, maybe I'm wrong, but what you never should do based on my experience is extending the Jupyter uh, engine. Don't do this one. This just, no, don't do it. So um, everything you are not able to do with extension, do with your own test engine, but don't extend the, uh, or inherit from, from the Jupyter engine. It's too complex. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, otherwise just try it. It's really easy. So, any okay. more questions? So, quite. I saw here some, some, some questions on Slack, some corrections from Chris, so uh, not reflecting utils, it's called reflection support, sorry for this. So whatever reflection support is there, use it from the GNF5 team, don't write it by yourself. That's the main message I want to say. Uh, Anybody has, has a question about JNF5 you want to ask? Okay. Yes, a simple way to migrate in fails from JM to JM5. Simple way of migrating the test itself. Mostly, mostly it really depends on how complex you have done your JUnit 4 stuff. So if this was 
good and maintainable written, not too freaky in terms of inheritance and mixing up stuff, which will be easy. It's, it's just a regular um, refactoring project. So it's, it's like, it's, it's your production code. It's, it's the same as, as, as you have done for your customers. So um, mostly the, the pain mostly is that the source code base for the four project, if you have a legacy project, is so old that you have a huge amount of layers inside this one. And to get rid of this, you really have to, to define if, if you want to rewrite it or if you want to migrate it. So, um, but what you should do if, if so what, what I personally do is if I want to migrate, I'm uh, just creating not the line coverage, I'm creating the mutation test coverage because this is a way stronger coverage and try to increase with the existing test environment the mutation test coverage and then migrating because this is a, this is a stronger one compared to line coverage. I have a talk on, on YouTube about mutation test coverage or I can give it here again. So um, feel free to, to check this one out because mutation test coverage is really, it's a strong thing. Um, yeah. So this, uh, really I recommend. want to open the context of the uh, maiden case uh, because in a mix mode it doesn't run in parallel so much, but in a native for, for say just JM5 it runs okay. Yeah. So there, there is from from Chris is uh, one one implementation. So I'm not using this Surefire whatever plugin. I'm using this one from uh, from Chris here. So, um, because this makes my life very easy. So, but I can, can check the, the, the link to the GitHub repository and share it. So, I'm, I'm not using Failsafe and, and Shofi anymore. I'm just using this one. It's tiny, it's fast. Ah, here already. Here's the JUnit platform Maven plugin. We posted it in the chat already. So, this I'm using in production now and it's, it's solving a bunch of challenges I had, especially with Shofi. So um, otherwise, concurrent execution is always a pain if you're not clear with state. So it's like regular code. And um, I think in JUnit 4, a bunch of stuff must be static. And this is painful. And this is just not existing in JUnit uh, 5. But um, as far as I understood it right, there's no guarantee how often an instance of a test class will be created. So if you have three tests inside this test instance, it's not guaranteed that it's just invoked once and then uh, invoking all three test methods or it's in uh, creating for every test invocation in your instance. So there's no guarantee. It means you have to make sure that every single test in, is perfectly just atomic. So, and it means don't, don't use static and all that stuff. So it's just regular if you have to deal with concurrent Immutability, concurrent uh, stuff, not no static. Don't don't use uh, barrier legend, whatever stuff. So okay. we have a question in the chat. Yeah. From Mark, uh, you can see it. Uh, second from last. Um, I think I saw something. So I'm not really sure. But what you should do is say, is this pioneer? project. So everything that's not going to the core JUnit 5 project is collected in this Pioneer project. And um, I think they have a list of already known test engine, custom test engines. So have a look there. Um, but I personally never, never use it. So I, I can't say yes or no. I see Chris answers that Spock 2 will be 100% running on the JUnit platform. Okay, cool. So, well, okay. So, um, if there are uh, no more questions, then I think uh, it was very, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, Sven. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot for thanks a lot for sharing this information. Uh, I think it's sometimes uh, it seems uh, a lot of information, but it gives people uh, spark spark ideas that sometimes you know get cooked in your brain and you use them uh, later. 
Yeah. So that sort of gives a really good ideas. So thanks a lot for sharing. And then, um, and for the community, we're going to see you. We have a, a next, in September, we have two lectures. Uh, also seem uh, quite interesting. So hope to see you all uh, in September lectures.